I guess you'll have a countdown. Good. All right. Uh, whenever you're ready, Evan. All right. Welcome to the latest episode of the Tectonic Takes podcast. We are going to be previewing the game for match week four between the San Jose Earthquakes as they go on the road to face St. Louis City FC in the first ever meeting between these two sides. I'm one of your hosts, Ivan Ornelas, with me today with another Tectonic Takes member, Abram, and our friend from the Soccer Talk Lads podcast, Justin. So, Abram, first of all, how are you? I'm doing very well. Uh, I got to take a nap before before the show. You gave Perfect. me ample time. It was, yeah. it was great. I feel so rejuvenated. Um, and I'm here and I'm ready to go. Nice. And then, uh, Justin, how are you? How are things with the Soccer Talk lads uh, in the first few weeks of this maiden MLS voyage? Yeah, it's good. We are excited to actually talk about games now, which was something yeah. like we've been, we started the podcast when the team was announced. So it's been three years of just like, what do we even talk about? So it's nice to have like a weekly something to dive into for sure. Right. So, yeah, for about like two and a half years to two and three quarters of a year of your podcast existence, there's been a lot of speculation, announcing managers, players being signed, stadiums. And now you see it all come together and you see this team win the first three games of the regular season beyond any expectations, I imagine. Yeah. I mean, we kind of said before the start of the season that like we think this team is going to be like, not in embarrassment. So, like, our baseline was be better than Cincinnati. And I think, <laughs> like, with <laughs> having a goal and, like, having a direction, that was always going to be the case. But, like, three wins in three games and seeing them do it in, like, a sustainable way is beyond our expectations for sure. Yeah, not only uh, being better than FC Cincinnati in their opening season, of course, Cincinnati have since put it together. They had a lovely win over at Seattle Sounders of the weekend. Uh, even some of the other new teams, I mean, Charlotte comes to mind where, you know, they've had a very interesting offseason. Um, Want to, you know, once again, pay respects to Anton Walks. But uh, on the football side of things, it hasn't really been a great start for Charlotte's season. And I'm sure it's a bit disappointing for the fans to see a newer team kind of skip above them in the pecking order, at least for the time being. But uh, Abram, what are your thoughts on uh, St. Louis based on, you know, the results so far? Quite jealous, uh, to be honest. <laughs> um, I mean, they're kind of in a place where I've wanted us to be for a while, and we're just now kind of like rising to that level. I feel like. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, for someone who's been a, a Quakes fan since 2012, and then had to endure every season post 2012 till now, um, yeah, all I can say is that I've been pretty jealous of how quickly they've uh, found success in this league. Right. And I think that it's a great story for sure. I think St. Louis is such a great soccer town steeped in history. So many uh, great players have come from the St. Louis area. And we think of the other sports, um, you know, with the Cardinals, uh, they unfortunately have lost NBA teams and NFL teams, and they have the St. Louis Blues. So with the Cardinals and Blues, you have two teams that are proven champions. And I think St. Louis CFC has the infrastructure to be a successful MLS franchise. We won't go forecasting, you know, too much beyond that just now. But in, from the here and now, I think it's been a really great start for them. So why don't you uh, give us a reminder of the results of the first three matches for St. Louis, Justin? Yeah, so St. Louis is coming into match day four with three wins, no draws, no losses. Uh, that 3-2 victory over Austin opening night, which was just a very nice surprise because that was a game you go into. Austin coming off this, like the season they had last year, you're expecting to, you know, go there and on the road in a hostile, hostile environment. You're not expecting to come away with a win um, in the fashion that you do. The home opener, they win 3-1 to one against Charlotte after going down one nothing and coming back and kind of dominating that game. And then, of course, over the weekend, they win 2-1 to one against Portland. Another game, third game in a row, they go down one nothing. They come back, they grab two goals. And, again, in a way where you kind of win the important battles. It's not like they're escaping these games. Luckily, they're putting their ethos to work and winning these games, so. Yeah, I think it's been very impressive. I think they set the tone for the season with that win over Austin. They face adversity. Austin, 
uh, showed flashes of their attacking threat. You know, players like Sebastian Driussi, uh many people would think, oh, yeah, p- that player's going to be foaming at the mouth, an expansion side, capping him on MLS Fantasy. And but, he did uh, get us. Don't get, don't get that yes. wrong. He, uh, yeah. he did get his goal. It was right. fantastic, but <laughs> yes, and now all of a sudden you have people transferring in St. Louis City players into their fantasy team. Your Lewins, your Strouds, you know, some great options there. <laughs> yeah, Lewin's been a breath of fresh air. I think with like a lot of the preseason predictions too, it's there are a lot of unknowns with the St. Louis roster. So the fact that Lewins hit the ground running and it's just been like the driving force behind that team, and then of course Klaus as well. Uh, you hit on your two DPS and then get players that are maybe underutilized, underappreciated elsewhere that are hitting the ground running too. All right. And another player that's enjoying a pretty strong start to the season, or another club, sorry, that's starting a pretty strong start to the season, after a shaky result against Atlanta United. Uh, Abram, why don't you tell us about uh, the San Jose Earthquake season so far in more depth? Every time I hear the name Atlanta, I just have flashbacks. <laughs> to seven minutes. And then, yeah, um... Yeah, uh, so, of course, we had the uh, heartbreaking result against Atlanta. We were up 1-0 until the 90th minute, and then, for some reason, the ref decided we need seven more minutes. And then, um, I think everyone remembers what happened. Almada just showed his quality. Um, uh, not too much more to say on that. I mean, it was, it was very disappointing at the time. But then we kind of reconciled that with our two following uh results uh, with uh, Whitecaps and Colorado. Um, I thought that we were the better team in all three games. I think that Atlanta was obviously the most um, competitive game. They did show uh, their quality, especially after, I think, 60 minutes. Um, We kind of, like, faltered in fitness. But um, the next two games, we really imposed ourselves on the opposition, and uh, we we ended up getting the results. my only issue is that the, the margins were a little bit small. We won by one goal each time. Um, and I, I did appreciate the grit that we showed against Whitecaps to uh, come from behind. But for me, uh, those are probably some of the weaker teams that we're going to be facing this season. Um, so I did worry a little bit, but I think that once we get going more, we will um, probably find uh, ourselves scoring more goals and getting more um numbers on the board all right so now that we've got that picture of where the teams have been so far i want to pick out a few players that i think are interesting going into this match and then we'll go to justin and then abram uh to go into more depth into you know starting 11s and other key pieces there so on the st louis side of things i think a big coup for them in goalkeeper, I think, was Roman Berkey. I think getting a player with such great experience in the Bundesliga and for big clubs in the Bundesliga, I think, is really important. You have a lot of European influence in your roster through the ownership. Uh, Thomas Ostrak from Czech Republic, Edward Lewin. Uh, you have Rasmus Elm from Sweden. So some great options there. Even your Brazilian forward, Klaus, he sounds very German too. So, uh, And, of course, some... American players, you know, with so many great connections to the city of St. Louis from an American development standpoint, you have the likes of <clears throat> Tim Parker, Jared Strout, and uh, John Nelson, Indiana Vasilev, you know, about two states over Indiana, so very fitting. As for San Jose Earthquakes, I think that we have an intriguing mix of players that are coming toward their prime, and particularly in the attacking sense. We've gotten good returns already from uh, the likes of Jeremy Obobese and Christian Espinoza. And then, of course, an infusion of youth as well with, you know, Cade Cowell, Benji Kakanovich. We hope to see Nico Tsikarius at some point this season, currently with an adductor injury. Uh, some reinforcements in defense, the likes of Jonathan Mensa and you know, Carlos Sacapo is now finding his role in this defense. And then an intriguing goalkeeper battle. We had uh, Daniel start the first two games of the season. He picked up an injury with the thigh. So JT Marcikowski played in the game against the Colorado Rapids. So, Justin, tell us uh, your take on, you know, how St. Louis plays together as a starting eleven and some more players that you find are important contributors so far. Yeah, I think the... 
interesting thing for this team is that Brantley Carnell has run with three different starting 11s for the first three games. Uh, last mm-hmm. game, even, like, relying on the youth, Miguel Perez, 17-year-old, making his first start, and he goes 66 minutes. Uh, Rasmus Ulm got the start last game, but he's kind of been working in and out with Nicholas Giochini. Giochini has sometimes played up as a striker. He sometimes played out as the wing and more in the deep and deeper in the midfield. So they have a lot of flexibility with their midfield group and their attacking group, like outside of Lewin and Klaus and like Hebert Parker, uh, every, and Berkey, of course, everything else is kind of, you know, you can plug and play a little bit. Um, their fullback play between you know, Jake Derwinski and John Nelson has been good as well. I'm not necessarily sold that those are like long-term situations there. If that's the long-term solution, but so far so good. And, yeah, I think the thing that surprised me is the tactical flexibility that Bradley Carnell rolls with just with different players. And, of course, putting such faith in a teenager to be kind of the rock in your, in your midfield as well. Yeah, I think uh, speaking on Nicholas Giacchini for a moment, uh, he was very notable in the last few years when he established himself a little bit in the U.S. men's national team roster. He got a few caps here and there. He got a couple goals. Uh, mostly playing in France toward Chan or Can uh, in the know. second division of Ligue 2. And then he had a loan spell at Montpellier before going through Orlando, and then that's through the expansion draft that he landed in St. Louis. So a bit of a vagabond career for the 22-year-old. I'm sure he's got an eye on a return to Europe at some point, but what was your uh, first impression so far of Giochini? Yeah, I think he's been very good, and I wasn't expecting him to start, especially in that second game. Um, he made a good impact in the first game, obviously impressed Carnell, and they like what they have in him. Obviously, still a young player, so, you know, they like their youth. They like players that they can kind of mold into their system. And, like, I think for Giochini, too, he's in a spot where he kind of has a specific role. That's what Klaus said is, like, so important with this squad, and... So you come into a system where you know what's expected of you and you can kind of make your mark and, you know, maybe bounce back to Europe after having a good couple of seasons here. So I think, like, knowing that those are the expectations for him and knowing that there isn't, like, a need for him to perform here, too, like, I think that's part of it as well. Yeah, I think with this current era of MLS, I think that we are a bit more welcoming of a potential young player, be it a in their early 20s, if they take a few years in MLS, if they have dipped their toes in Europe, that it's not going to be like this forever exile. They're going to spend the next decade in MLS and never develop beyond that. I think that the way that MLS has been developing youth players more and more and to be more transactional, players coming to Europe and then players going to Europe, I think that it's a bit more intriguing for the youth players to come in and they're not just going to be buried on the bench behind veteran players, MLS favorites, coaches favorites, that they're going to be given the resources they need, and they're still going to be in the shop window for players across Europe, whether it be the big five leagues, whether it be that next tier like the Eredivisie, or maybe a more interesting league like uh, Turkey or Belgium, where Mm -hmm. some of those clubs, like we may not see them week to week here in the United States, but they have an opportunity to compete in any of the three now European uh, competitions. So there's a lot of options there, and I think that's something with Earthquakes fans, with the likes of Kid Cal, Benji Kikanovic. We saw uh, Marcos Lopez go to Europe last season, too, uh, that we're kind of in this middle stage where, like, we're excited when our players do get a chance to leave or when they're even linked to clubs. At the same time, we want to keep them, but we also don't want to hold them back. So it's really tough, you know, being an MLS fan in that sense. Yeah, you're like that that in-between step, but you want to hold on to players, but you also don't want to limit their chances of going elsewhere, for right. sure. <laughs> and MLS is not a bad place to be. Ask, uh, this is the last time I mentioned in the podcast, sorry, Abram, Thiago Amada, as an MLS player, he won the World Cup. So, you know, it's definitely possible, you know, sky's the limit. The destination league, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, like every year, um, I mean, every World Cup, we do see more and more MLS representation here. And that has also influenced the diversity of the league and the diversity of the clubs. Mm. You know, so many nationalities and so many clubs now. And I was writing about the Oakland Roots yesterday and seeing, you know, players from, you know, Trinidad and Tobago, J- Jamaica, even in 
you know, Lesotho and Burundi, Sierra Leone and Oakland Roots. And now here in San Jose Earthquakes, I believe Carlos Gakpo is the first player in MLS from Equatorial Guinea. So nice. it's really yeah. exciting. So I got a couple other uh, thoughts on the St. Louis players before we go back to San Jose Earthquakes. One last thought on the current player. So Klaus, he's this big 6'3 striker, but he has great technical abilities. So how would you describe his style of play for someone who hasn't watched St. Louis this season? Yeah, he's the type of player, too, that you expect him to be this big physical forward that, like, he has great hold-up play for sure, but he also has more technical skill and flair that you would maybe not expect watching him, like, minute by minute. Um, on the game-winning goal in... Yeah, I, forget if that was yeah the austin game winning goal where he is able to kind of get onto the ball while he's running and do a nice little like cut back inside the box to get it onto a stronger foot like plays like that where he has close in close touches and nice skill you forget like oh this guy he's not just a ginormous human being but he also can do some things with the ball that you aren't expecting for him and he's kind of hit the ground running um i wrote a piece about him in stl magazine talking about just how he's wanted a place and a role to to excel in. He's kind of been a bit of a journeyman in Europe the past couple of years. Uh, he had a nice loan spell at Lask in Austria where he played really well. And then when he went back to Offenheim, he just wasn't able to find his footing and find like a concrete spot to play. So having that, like like we said earlier with Giochini, having that defined role in, in the system and you know what's expected of you, like he's excelled in that so far. All right. Uh, before I uh, ask one final question about the squad, Abram, is there a player or players in St. Louis that you wanted to talk about or question? I mean, we were talking before we started recording about uh, Leuven. Um, uh, Justin was saying uh, he liked his movement and uh, his work rate. And I'm looking at his stats. I, I, I watched a little bit of the, the previous game, but I had not enough to, you know, get an actual, you know, uh, picture of how uh what he's like as a player but um three goals and assists in three games mm. that's um that's very strong you can't say anything against that so um that's someone especially with our, our the state of our midfield that i'm worried about coming into the next game yeah your mls assist leader and like the thing too is he can play kind of all over the midfield so the first two games they had him kind of sitting back next to shabulu blom who is their south african defensive midfielder who's still kind of working his way into the system because he arrived so late in preseason, but he's a player that they are very happy with that they want to move forward as they're like set your defensive mid going forward. So they sit Lubin next to him. They give him a little more freedom in the midfield to kind of ping longer, more direct passes. Last game, they played a little bit differently against Portland. They wanted to get Lewin on the ball when he was in motion and you can kind of see his vision. And just like once he gets the ball, he was making passes that were unlocking the back line and he's also your set piece taker so that's where those assists come from too so he's yeah. just uh they're all around good player when we um last season i, I write for um six two and i that was not fun <laughs> it was not <laughs> fun playing them with our, our, our six two squad so yeah they're definitely that's a very strong player you guys have yeah, they were, uh, that was the period where, like, yeah, these guys should not be in MLS next round. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is like Ben Schwarmer's where you had that uh, Dominican guy with the paper that said, I am 12. Like, you know, they're just wrecking. Yeah, they should shop. not be in this league, you know. <laughs> Yeah. So speaking of uh, our writing, and by the way, make sure you check out Abrams' works, uh, Justin's works, and myself too. So in the latest edition of my blog series, The Beautiful Game, uh, Chapter 3, my theme was adversity. And I focus a bit on Manchester United, how they went from losing Liverpool uh, 7-0, they beat Real Betis 4-1, but then the next game against Southampton, they had to sell for a 0, zero draw, and they get red card, and Casemiro uh, is now suspended for a few games. Abram, do we know how much Jamir Montero is suspended, or we're just assuming for this one game? So, I'm not the right person to ask for this. To be <laughs> right. um, so, um, I talked to Crystal. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're a Quakes fan, you should know who Crystal is. Yeah, she's know. a rock star. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and she had said that they are waiting to hear back on right. the um, suspension today. 
Uh, right. So we will know later uh, today as a recording. Um, but it, I, I don't know what the um, you know official uh, fine is for grabbing someone's neck, uh, which barely did. Anyways, yeah. um, so I don't yeah, think like, it This is a red card. I just grabbed my neck just now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to get out of here, Evan. Yeah. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, I can't imagine it'll be more than one game. Um, yeah. And if it is, that's kind of, that's a disgrace. Because he didn't mean to do it anyways. And if you are going to judge that he like should still get suspended for an accident, then I don't think it should be more than one game. That's just my opinion. Yeah, I, I believe so. So, uh, Justin, did you get a chance to look at that uh, play that resulted in the red card? Yeah, like, to me, it's one of those plays where they, like, have to give the red, you know, just by, like, the the rule book. Um, and then, like, when you look at it later, there's no, like, subsequent suspension. That's what, like, my read would be. Obviously, you don't know, but, uh, like, I don't think MLS would suspend him more than a game for that. Right. Yeah, it is unfortunate. Um, Jamero Montero started uh, his season last year with a suspension, and it was especially unfortunate because the next game we played was against Philadelphia Union. That would have been a great uh, opportunity for him to uh, keep uh, have a com- uh, ability to play against, and then maybe before and after the games exchange some words and uh, reconnect with some of his former teammates. But uh, we're going to have to soldier on without him for a bit. Uh, and I know I'm kind of bouncing back and forth, but since I did mention Liverpool, my last thought with St. Louis players was the links to Roberto Firmino. And you mentioned mm-hmm. you have two DPs, one slot remaining. What would you think about the possibility of that move in the summer? And, you know, do you want it to happen? How do you think that would work? Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of of two minds in that, like, if you have a chance to sign Roberto Firmino, yeah. you'd do it, right? <laughs> like... He is familiar with the game and present style, of course, you know, being playing under Klopp for so long. And, you know, he's obviously a player that's going to be okay with working a bit defensively. They already have a starting striker. So, like, yeah. at that point, I think that Carnell would, if the signing were to happen, if it were to get over the line, which I don't think it happens because it sounds like Milan are after him too, which, like, at Firmino at this point in his career, he probably wants to stay in Europe. But if... St. Louis is able to pull it off. There's a lot of ifs there. Uh, Like, I think with, if you look at the way that Klaus played as a dual striker next to Giochini in the Charlotte game, like, that worked out really well. Giochini played a great game. If you have Roberto Firmino in the Giochini spot, like, that's a very dynamic forward core of a guy who is what Roberto Firmino is, which is very talented, very quick, very good on the ball, a lot of flair. And then Klaus with his kind of physical presence, like, that's a nice... A nice one-two punch, I would say. Um, is that where they need to use their last DP spot? Like, I don't know if that works out best for them, especially since Firmino is 31, so maybe a shorter contract. I don't know. But, like, you, if you have the chance, you you just have to go for it. Yeah, I think yeah, you mentioned Milan, and that's another interesting situation to think about with their striker situation. A lot of moving parts, the aging Olivier Giroud and Zlatan Ibrahimovic, as well as a potential Rafael Leal mm. sale. So Roberto Firmino would make a lot of sense for AC Milan there too. Um, and also noticing around you know MLS, you know when you see players go to non LA, New York, MLA, uh, M- Miami. Uh, uh, squads, I think of players like, you know, Santiago Arias now at uh, FC Cincinnati, uh, Wayne Rooney, and then later Christian Benteke at DC United. So, Abram, what do you think about uh, how Roberto Firmino would possibly do in MLS? Um, so, yeah, I was, like, listening to Justin speak about, like, being spoiled for choices in that, you know, kind of position. And if they did get him, they would definitely be, like, suffering from success in a way. Just like, where do you play all these mm. class players? Um, and I know that he can play like a, a kind of deeper role, like more in the midfield. But um, at the same time, it's also like whoever you have right now it, who would be playing uh, in his spot, I think you'd probably go with Firmino. Um, I don't know. That's just uh, my opinion as someone who you know, doesn't follow um, St. Louis too closely. But. Um, I would rather he didn't come because I don't want to play against him. <laughs> um, but it would definitely be a very um, exciting transfer for mm. the league. I think of these players coming in. Um, some might say that it makes it look like a retirement league, 
I would disagree. I think it's just increases the overall quality of the league and uh, brings more eyes to the sport. And I think um, that's only a good thing um, for us, especially as people who make uh, content for this sport. Right. And I would definitely not use Roberto Firmino as an example for MLS being a retirement league. Again, he's still 31. He's the same age that someone like Robbie Keane came to LA Galaxy mm. in 2012, and he stayed at LA Galaxy for multiple years, I think even toward the Steven Gerrard era of LA Galaxy. So there's a lot of ways that these strengths can go, and I don't think one move will redefine an era in that sense. Yeah, so, and uh, to kind of add on that, yeah. so Firmino does have some ties in that his, so Roger Whitman's his agent, that's also Klaus's agent, and then uh, ties with Blutz at Hoffenheim as well. So there are like some through lines to like why Firmino would maybe have had contact with St. Louis. So it's interesting for sure. But yeah. Right. And his contract uh, would potentially expire with Liverpool on the July 1st of this summer. We play St. Louis again after this weekend at home at Saturday, June 24th. So even if Romina does come, that's the only thing we get to play him. So it's a win win. <laughs> <laughs> but I, that fear is still very valid, and you probably didn't have the schedule in front of you like I did, Abram. So that's okay. <laughs> uh, so, Abram, why don't you give us some more intel on the San Jose Earthquake squad through three games into this? Uh, yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, did you want to hear about, like, uh, players, or, like, what did you want to hear about specifically? I guess we could start with the midfield, because now we're going to have to reshuffle the deck a little bit for this game. Uh, yeah, um, so, we obviously lost, uh, Jermaine Montero, who is a huge piece in our midfield, um, in our attack, just always moving, always attacking the ball, um, and really uh, setting up our attacks. Um, and he covers a lot of ground. He, he's always moving and quickly. And so it, it, for me, I'm really um, worried. And um, I think that this will um, give us a chance to see someone like Valdissimo come in um, and have like more like, of a like a double eight instead of like having a center attacking mid as in in that three. Um, I think Yule will end up being the more um, attacking uh, midfielder. Um, if we had Nico Chikiris, it would be a lock. Like I think that no one would dispute that he's ready. Uh, he showed against LA Galaxy and and anyone you played against really. Like uh, I think he had a, a highlight against Seattle where he just like sombreroed the guy and then took a shot with his weak foot. Very, very uh, exciting player, and it's, it's really a shame that um, he's out for another few weeks. Um, uh, so, yeah, I'm thinking that we see Baldissimo. Um, everyone in the Discord is really rooting for Tommy Thompson. Everyone's on that Tommy <laughs> Thompson game. Saz um, is definitely rooting for Tommy Thompson. <laughs> for sure. Uh, and that would be my pick, honestly, if I was um, Lucci, then. I think Tommy has the most swaz techers on the whole team. He, he can, I don't know if you watch the warmups, but he does a rainbow flick volley from like almost half field every game, like the warm up. And it's the sickest thing ever. Especially you have to reward that level of sauce. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. If we were starting players based on swag, Tommy Thompson mm -hmm. would be a locked in starter, even to this day. Um, right. And so I, I think that it would be really, um, rewarding for us as Quakes fans to see our first homegrown finally take um, his spot and where we all wanted him to be in that center midfield um, after having him, you know, be right back for, for a long time. I know when I played, um, I was stuck in that right back role just because nobody else wanted to play there, um, and I could. Um, so I think that, yeah, it would be a lot of um, fun to see Tommy there, but... Um, whether or not we will, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure. Right. So you definitely covered a lot of ground on that midfield. Uh, another point of interest for me is the defense, which currently I feel like our lineup is a capo as right back, our pairing of Mensa and Rodriguez, especially while Nathan is still out long term for an injury. And then at left back, we have Miguel Traco. And then Palmeri is usually our option off the bench. So. We have a lot of new faces in this back line, but it seems like they're gelling together pretty well, Abram. What do you think? 
Oh, yeah, man. It's like JT barely had to do anything uh, against Colorado. And that is really something you do not get to say with the San Jose Earthquake team. Uh, they were getting to everything. Mensa and Rodriguez both individually are amazing. And it's really um, cool to see them cover like their different zones. And nothing gets by them, really. Uh, Acapo in the first half, for me, was man of the match. He was, he was moving up and down. Uh, he was winning the ball. He was linking up with Christian Espinosa really well, which is what we were like really wanting to see. You know, those those two on the right side, it makes us really strong on that side. We were already strong with Espinosa by himself, with even with just Tommy, you know. And no disrespect to Tommy, but um, Acapo is really an upgrade on, on the right back spot. And yeah, Choco, just a new one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Abram. I saw Justin. Yeah. Go ahead. Choco, of course, um, is another uh, new signing. New signing. But he he's so classy, so smart, street smart. Uh, it's hard to get by him, really, and, and looking at him, you wouldn't think he's that difficult to, to take on, but he just wins the ball a lot, and then when he gets the ball, he's so calm and collected and then has a lot of skill to make something happen with it. So our defense is looking really good, and I'm just really excited to um, to see what else they do because it's been super rewarding as a quick fan. All right, and Justin, I saw your hand. Did you want to add something? Oh, no, sorry. I was just uh, okay. scratching. But... <laughs> okay, no problem. Uh, and you make a point, Abram, about how the defense made life a lot easier for JT. He might argue he made it too easier because he's trying to win the starting spot back from Daniels. Like, okay, you guys, I think we're bad win. You guys just want to let me save one shot like so I could let Lucci know who's the boss, you know. But uh, I think that that's going to be an interesting battle and finally a good problem to have. I think we didn't really have too many of these debates in terms of starters versus bench in many of our positions last year because we felt like we were very thin. So now it feels like we have some depth across, you know, even goalkeeper, but definitely as well as defense, midfield, and forward. And that's going to be pretty interesting, especially now that we know that San Jose Quicks is capable of going somewhat far in the U.S. Open Cup, as long as we can avoid Sacramento. But <laughs> uh, hopefully, you know, some more success in that department. Uh, Justin, do you have any thoughts on uh, the San Jose Earthquake squad? Any questions for us? Oh, I was yeah, I was going to ask like for you guys, what's been the biggest difference under Lucci this season? Because it seems like San Jose like is playing much more, I guess like free flowing than they had been. So like I'd love to know. What uh, you Abram, think. go ahead. Uh, sure. Um, yeah. So I think that we've always been a strong passing side with uh, Yule in, in that midfield, but with the um, Acquisition of Guezo, uh, obviously Yule's more opened up, and uh, him and Montero have like more uh, room to uh, maneuver and go into a higher position and then make those triangles. It was just we, boop, 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 like the yeah. we were like uh, chanting "Ole" every time that they would, would make a pass because they just couldn't touch us. White Caps were having a really tough time at the end of the game. Um, and I also really like the um, not being scared to, if you have to, put it over the top. I mean, Cade Cowell is probably going to get there. <laughs> if he can't get far enough, he's going to run faster than whoever whoever the right back is. Um, and that also works for Espinosa on the other side. So, yeah, not being scared to just put the ball in. Uh, we saw that with the uh, Montero goal. Uh, not Montero. Montero assists to Jabo. Um, uh yeah, we wouldn't see that in Almeida there. We kind of just, like, possess the ball and possess too much and not actually create anything. But now we look like we have a purpose and we have a, um, a plan of attack, and it's really nice to see. Yeah, it yeah. seems like it's unlocked Espinosa a bit, at least, like, watching from the outside. Not to say that Espinosa hasn't always been a quality player, but he just seems much more creative this year. Right. Espinoza is uh, chasing the all-time San Jose Earthquakes assist record. Uh, Shea Salinas currently holds that. Shea Salinas, along with Chris Wondolowski, holding down the fort in assists and goals, respectively, for the last decade or so. And now the torch has been passed to this next generation of San Jose Earthquakes players, and I feel like it's been a good transition, at least for this year so far. Cool. Yeah, so my thoughts on the difference between 2022 versus 2023, I feel like it's been the midfield. The midfield has been a night and day difference on 
the offensive side when they're more linking up with the front three, the front three as well feel like they have more confidence because they're getting more service and opportunities. But also when the other team has the ball, I feel like <clears throat> almost every team we played against last season, they had some sort of edge in midfield, whether it be a more physical uh, defensive mid or just a more clear-cut uh, playmaker. And while we still don't have, like, you know, the best player in either category in MLS, uh, I feel like the style of play under Lucci has developed so that not one player is the star of the show in our midfield. Like, everyone is able to interchange responsibilities. I feel more confident in Yule's ability to be versatile in different midfield roles like he used to be and he still has always been in some ways. And just in terms of, you know, overall performance, I felt like they've been closing halves better too. I think that we can see so many goals last season, particularly at the end of the first half. But in this Colorado Rapids game, uh, I think we survived a scare. There was a shot that went wide at right post. But then for the last five minutes of that first half after that, I don't think Colorado Rapids barely got into our half. It felt like we controlled the ball. I feel like we just still could do a little bit more with the ball sometimes in those situations. But ultimately, I think that you can't always win a game in the first half. You can certainly lose a game and give yourself an uphill battle, as San Jose Earthquakes did many times last season. So just those these early tests and shifting those bad habits into good habits, I think, is a good foundation to build on. Did you want to add something, April? Uh, yeah, uh, I fully agree with uh, with that and the philosophies that you were um, kind of like citing. Um, you were saying the midfield is a uh, you know a big part, um, but um, Justin asked what's the biggest difference, and I think that uh, a huge difference that that's allowed us to play the way we do is the personnel that we have in our defense now. Mm-hmm. Um, we love Tommy Thompson. We love Paul Marie. Uh, we love Tanner Beeson. Uh, we're rocking with him. But those three starting in your back line, um, Nathan can only do so much. And so now yeah. we have Rodriguez uh, or Holdrigues, however <laughs> the Portuguese say it. Um, and then uh, Mensa, huge. It, it just transformed the whole team. And I think that we feel safe to do what we want uh, to the other team. You know what I mean? Right. And with Tanner Beeson, he's 25 years old, so he's not the youngest player, but in terms of like professional experience is still pretty new and being a center back, you know, he's still got maybe another decade in front of his career mm-hmm. if all goes according to plan. So I think this year, maybe taking a step back for him and pressure is off a little bit. He can still play in cup games and midweek games and he'll get his opportunities. I think that there's going to be less expected of him and he's going to be a better player for it. Totally agree. All right. So to wrap up our uh, podcast here, I think score predictions are a little bit arbitrary. I think Justin and I, we've had a conversation about the arbitrariness of power rankings, and I feel Mm. like score predictions sometimes can be too. So I guess I just will uh, give you this question and you fill in the the answer. Uh, My club will win this game. The Battle of the Saints, you know, we could call it St. Joseph like versus San Luis, you know, to mix it up a bit. But uh, St. Louis will win this game if what happens, Justin? If they're able to dictate play. That's mm-hmm. the big thing. And that's what they've been able to do through these first three games is they're not necessarily letting other teams dictate their style to them. They're coming in with a game plan and they're executing it for better at this point. But that would be the thing is just making sure that they are well within their game plan again and both teams like to open it up a bit so i think that's gonna be pretty fun all right abram the sounds earthquakes will win this game if what happens uh if we stop them from doing what justin said (laughs) (laughs) um so yeah unfortunately with uh, montero being gone i do think that uh us gaining the the ability to dictate tempo will be really tough so I think that if we can get our attack uh, filing on uh, all cylinders, I'm hoping uh, Benji gets uh, the start um, against um, St. Louis. Uh, not because I don't like Cade, I love Cade, but we've seen um, he's in one of those slumps right now. And Benji is a very consistent player, very capable player. And 
Uh, he comes up big in big moments. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, we got um, a little bit of a guest here. Yeah. Our, <laughs> from our dog in the background. <laughs> yeah, the dog's on the squirrel and he's trying to, yeah. Um, oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. He's just exactly. letting you know about it. Uh, where yeah. was I? <laughs> yeah, Benji, um, I think, could make a big difference, especially with Espinosa whipping the crosses in from the right side to the left. If it goes past Jabo, uh, Benji will be right there. So, yeah, I'm, hope, I'm hoping their attack can uh, really make up for the midfield um, and uh, the lack of Jermaine Montero because we're going to need to score goals to keep uh, these guys out. So I'll add one more curveball with my statement. San Jose Earthquakes will win this game if Jackson Ewell gets equal to or more goal tr- contributions than Edward Leuven. So I think that's going to be a key battle for me. They may not be directly marking each other, one on offense, one on defense. But I think this is Jackson Ewell's opportunity to show that he's still one of the key guys in our plans moving forward. I feel like when you think about the front six of the San Jose Earthquakes, you get a lot of excitement from Ibobasi and Espinoza through their goal contribution so far. Demir Montero is that lead uh, attacking midfielder. And then Kate Cowell, of course, who has the highest ceiling of any player in our team. So Jackson Ewell, I think some of the stigma from his outings with the U.S. men's national team over the last two years has started to creep in a little bit in the minds of some San Jose Earthquakes fans, and myself included, I'll admit to that. But the way he's been playing uh, near the end of last season, beginning of this season, I'm ready to, you know, believe in Jackson Ewell again. And I think that he'll have a big thing to say whether the San Jose Earthquakes can go on and get a positive result here. And it's going to be no easy feat going to the city of St. Louis. Uh, it's a beautiful city. It's a great stadium. This is going to be a fun matchup, and I can't wait to watch and share more conversations with both of you on the San Jose Quakes perspective and the St. Louis perspective as it unfolds. So uh, any final thoughts before we conclude? No, I'm looking forward to this one. Uh, something to remember, if St. Louis do win this game, they'll be the first expansion team to win their first four yeah. games. So going yeah. up against a little bit of history there as well. Yeah, take that, Sounders. <laughs> uh, Abram, any final thoughts? Uh, yeah, it's an exciting game. I think this is... Um big test for this team um, to see if we can, like, because, uh, like I said, the first three games, I think that we've been the better team on the ball, and I'm hoping that uh, we can do that again this game. My final thoughts are that in an exceptionally windy day uh, this Tuesday, March 14th, Pi Day, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, I think we're seeing winds of change for both teams. We see a little bit of a tailwind in San Jose Earthquakes, uh, I have be, I mean, on the back of these m- recent two victories back to back. But if that's a tailwind. This is like a full-on hurricane for St. Louis of excitement, and I think that it's going to be a full-on battle. And I can't wait to watch this game. It's going to be so entertaining. And I feel like it's one of those games where yes, both sides want to win, but I think that with how well they played in this first three, four games after this game transpires. I think we're still going to have a lot of good sample size for positivity and hope for getting to the playoffs. And then from there, we'll see. We'll get a clear picture as the season unfolds. So thank you once again to Justin and Abram for joining me here on this episode of the Tectonic Takes podcast. As always, you can find us in our Discord server, Tectonic Takes, and also interact with us on Twitter. Justin, where can people follow you on Twitter? Yeah, so at Horniker Justin, my last name, first name. All right, Abram. Uh, God, I really need to change my handle, but uh, my, <laughs> my, um, my handle is in French. Is je suis bam, um, je underscore suis underscore bam. Yeah, for those of you who don't speak French, that's J E and then S U I S and then B A M. All right, thank there you. We go. Thank Merci you. beaucoup. And then for me, you can yeah. follow me at Ivan Ornelas two I V A N O R N E L A S two on Twitter. Uh, check out all the great work done by Abram, Justin, myself, Fabi, Abel, all the soccer talk lads, all the tectonic takes. And we look forward to more great coverage and more great action here this Major League Soccer season. And can't wait to see what happens between San Jose Earthquakes and St. Louis City FC. So take care, everyone. Have a good night or whenever you listen. <laughs>